Starship is go for launch. After a number of regulatory hurdles and all that stacking and destacking, Starship is finally ready to go. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Thursday, the 16th of November, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Starship special! Just before we hop into all the super exciting Starship news, let's take a look at this week in launches. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a Falcon 9 from Vandenberg on November 11th at 1849 UTC. The rocket was carrying 113 payloads as part of SpaceX's SmallSat rideshare program to sun-synchronous orbit. This flight featured the short version of the MVAC engine nozzle extension aimed at lowering the cost of the engine for missions where the hit of performance doesn't affect the ability of Falcon 9 to place the payloads into their desired orbits. The first stage for this mission, B-1071, was flying for its 12th time and it successfully landed back on land at SpaceX's landing zone 4. Among the 113 payloads were 36 Super Dove satellites from Planet, as well as a prototype of the company's Pelican satellite. The flight also included the debut of Impulse Space's Mira space tug, which was confirmed to be functional and healthy after separation from Falcon 9's second stage. For a more in-depth rundown of the payloads, be sure to check out the launch article for this mission, written by NSF's Danny Lentz, at the link in the description below. Another Falcon 9 lifted off on November 12th at 2108 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. Falcon 9 was carrying two O3B M power satellites for SES into a medium transfer orbit. These O3B M power satellites were the fifth and sixth in SES's second generation constellation of O3B satellites, which are aimed at providing low latency internet connectivity to remote locations. The launch of these two satellites follows a lengthy stand-down following the launch of the previous four, which were found to have power issues during the initial checkouts. The first stage for this mission, B-1076, was flying for a ninth time, and it successfully landed on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. And of course, from the launches that happened this week, let's now go into the mega launch coming up really, really soon. Starship second flight test. You probably remember a few weeks ago, a video that DOS did explaining all of the things that needed to happen in order for us to reach this point. We have notice to mariners, both local notice to mariners and navigational hazard warnings. We have airspace restrictions for multiple airspace locations. We also have road closures scheduled for the next few days that say spaceflight activities in them. We also saw SpaceX installing the flight termination system as well, so pretty much the full house. And of course, the big ticket item in the last few weeks was the completion of the biological assessment by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service so that the FAA could complete the environmental side of the Starship license review. That's a mouthful, right? Well, let's break it all down. In a nutshell, this second flight has a lot of changes, so the FAA started an environmental review to take a look at them all. This is what they call the written reevaluation. It's a reevaluation of the new things added to the whole process so that they're within the bounds of the original environmental assessment performed in 2022. A similar thing occurred for Flight 1, where SpaceX had to assess the impact, no pun intended, to the marine life from the crash of each stage against the ocean under the nominal flight plan. This is probably something that you might have heard about. Yes, they actually had to make sure that they didn't hit sharks and whales out in the ocean. But thankfully, this time around, the change was closer to home, literally at the launch pad. The big change, of course, is the new water deluge system. For this environmental assessment, the FAA consulted with the Fish and Wildlife Service to perform a thorough study of the impact of this new deluge system. And spoiler alert, all is good to go. But to get to that point, the agency did its due diligence and wrote down all of its findings on its biological assessment. And by the way, this document is 505 pages long. While a majority of the document goes in depth about the effects of the system on the environment, it also shares some technical details about the system itself. For example, it lays out a potential for the system to be used up to 30 times per year, assuming there are up to 10 launches per year with an estimated two static fires per launch. It also hints about a second orbital launch mount with its own water deluge system. And while that won't be done right away, it's definitely something to keep an eye out for as time goes on. The document also recognizes that while approximately 132,000 gallons of water would be discharged for every launch event, 
a large majority of it would either go into the retention ponds at the launch site or just be vaporized during engine ignition. In fact, it says that during engine ignition, 92% of the water would vaporize. The study also went into great lengths to assess whether or not the water contained any pollutants that might be discharged into the surrounding area. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that is an issue either. It also explains the rationale from SpaceX to build this system. We have a huge video about it from a few months ago, but in short, the pad foundations were upgraded so as to not kick up debris, a steel plate was put on top to protect these foundations, and on top of that, this plate is water-cooled to protect it and to facilitate its reusability in the long term. With the biological assessment completed, the FAA was able to complete its written reevaluation, which largely summarizes this long review from the FWS, but it also adds other things that didn't come from them, like the addition of the hot staging ring. This ring, which the written reevaluation calls the forward heat shield interstage, is said to weigh approximately 20,000 pounds, or about 9 metric tons. And interestingly, it says that for some missions, quote, the forward heat shield would be jettisoned between 30 and 400 kilometers offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. Which is interesting because that would mean that this piece of equipment may be detached during flight after Starship separates from Super Heavy during the next launch of Starship. Of course, it also says for some missions, so the question now is which missions? Well, I'm sure we'll eventually find out one way or another. Oh, and by the way, we recently released a video talking all about the hot staging ring, so be sure to check that out for more analysis on this system. So with all of these documents signed off, we finally, yes, finally, got the modified launch license. And this license is pretty much the same one that was used for the first flight. It's the same license number, and it pretty much says the same thing, but the big difference is that now it authorizes SpaceX to fly Starship for its second test flight. So with that out of the way, Starship is fully cleared to launch, and its first launch attempt will happen no earlier than this Friday. Now a question remains, will this paperwork drama still be around for the third flight of Starship? Well, it'll depend a lot on the outcome of the second flight. The FAA has nine conditions under which it initiates a mishap investigation after a launch. One of the most restrictive ones triggers a launch mishap if there's a quote, failure to complete a launch or re-entry as planned. So if we take that literally, if Ship 25 doesn't go all the way around the globe and splash down in Hawaii, and Booster 9 doesn't end up in the Gulf of Mexico, basically a 100% perfect flight, then we'll probably see another mishap investigation pop up. But even if this flight is not 100% successful, the mishap investigation could be very short. And if SpaceX doesn't add something that could potentially impact the environment in a significant way, that'll also mean no need for the Fish and Wildlife Service to get involved either. So the better the second flight goes, the less modifications needed, the less paperwork needed, and the faster we could see a third launch of Starship. And hey, maybe you might want one of our 2024 calendars to write down your own guess as to when that third launch might happen. Definitely tell us in the comments what you think, and be sure to check out shop.nasaspaceflight.com to grab one. They make a great gift. And hey, while you're at it, check out our holiday-themed merch where we have not only sweaters, but for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, also regular shirts for you to wear. See, we think about you guys. We know it's summer down there. And speaking of the weather, I'm sure there are a lot of you out there who are very curious about what the weather will be like for Starship's next launch. So we consulted with our own Adam Suker for the forecast for the next few days. So let's take a look at the weather conditions for the next Starship flight. Fortunately, the weather is improving over the next few days as we have a ridge approaching our region. But that's short-lived as our next storm system is approaching Texas. Let's take a deep dive down into South Texas on Friday and see what the conditions look like. So as we look here, we're looking at the wind profile aloft. So from the surface down at the bottom all the way up into the atmosphere. One thing that SpaceX noted last time was they looked at directional shear. Directional shear would be this wind right here, which is changing direction with height. So think of the Starship going up and the wind hitting at different levels as it's going up. That's something they pay attention very closely to, but this is weak. So this is within their threshold. Yes, the winds do increase with height, but that's a telewind as Starship goes towards the Gulf of Mexico. Now for us viewing, everybody wants to know what the weather is gonna be like. Is it gonna be cloudy, sunny? Well, this computer model right here shows a 57 degree dew point with a 63 degree temperature. That means 
right there at the surface that the temperature dew point spread just enough that we should have clear conditions all the way up. Now, another model makes it look just like flight number one. Flight number one, we had a little bit of ground level fog, some low level clouds. This model is suggesting that could be possible, that we could have a little bit of that fog that slowly burns off as the daylight comes up because once you warm up that surface temperature, it'll allow that fog to burn off or even the low level clouds that typically come in from the sea breeze to burn off. That is possible, but we'll look with time and see if this changes as models progress. Because right now, it's a 50-50 split. We'll probably end up having maybe a little bit of a couple patchy clouds, but last time it burned off just in time. Hopefully it'll do the same on this next one. We'll keep you updated. Thanks, Adam. We'll definitely keep an eye on the sky and hope for no clouds. And a friendly reminder, we've been in pretty much full Starship coverage mode all this week with daily updates. And of course, we will also be live for the launch as well. So make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can stay totally up to date and you won't miss anything. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. The ever popular Dream Chaser has gotten even closer to launch with the first vehicle slated to fly, DC-101 Tenacity, nearly ready to leave its factory in Colorado and begin its voyage to NASA's Neil Armstrong Test Facility in Ohio. Recently, NSF was hosted at a media event by the vehicle's manufacturer, Sierra Space, where we learned that the company is aiming for a six-month turnaround, from its runway landing at the launch and landing facility at the Kennedy Space Center, to its next launch aboard ULA's Vulcan. In particular, CEO Tom Weiss said that they hope to launch Tenacity twice next year for their Commercial Resupply Services 2 contract with NASA. Currently under this contract, Dream Chaser has seven flights booked to carry cargo up to the crew of the International Space Station. If you want to learn more about this fabulous space plane, including what its near-term future could hold, make sure to check out this article over on our website, written by Sawyer Rosenstein. The final piece of the ULA puzzle has arrived, as the upper stage for the first flight of Vulcan is now at the launch site and preparations are well underway to prepare the vehicle for a pre-launch wet dress rehearsal. This rehearsal should occur within the next few weeks, and it'll see both the core stage and the Centaur 5, the first and second stages respectively, fully loaded with their liquid methane, liquid hydrogen, and liquid oxygen. If all goes well, we should be seeing the first launch attempt in the early hours of Christmas Eve in December. However, should conditions not work out for this timing, additional opportunities are available on December 25th, 26th, and next January. The Orion spacecraft scheduled for use on Artemis 2 and its service module have been powered up for the first time since they've been mated together. Now that NASA's teams inside of the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at the Kennedy Space Center have switched on Orion, the crew module will be put through a three-part test, which will include important evaluations of the eight power and data units that assist with Orion's communication between its components and its flight computers. NSF's Eyes in the Sky, Harry Stranger, has been keeping track of Landspace's Zuka 2 rocket over the last few days, and it looks like they're preparing for the rocket's third launch. This image, captured last Saturday, shows the 50-meter-tall Methalox Pathfinder standing tall on its launch pad at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. This varies from this image, taken half a week prior, where the rocket can clearly be seen lying down. Now, while there aren't really official updates being released about Zuka 2's third flight, these satellite images give us a good indication that Landspace is gearing up for some sort of flight at some time in the future. As of right now, the Pathfinder has rolled back to its normal resting spot, which is outside of the hangar. Everything on the surface of Mars and in orbit around it has stopped communicating with Earth. But don't worry, it's perfectly normal. Starting last Saturday and lasting for 14 days, Mars will be passing behind the Sun from Earth's perspective, meaning that any communications would need to go through the Sun, which is not possible. For some instruments, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory will just be turning them off. But for others, such as the Ingenuity helicopter, they'll still be collecting data. Ingenuity won't be flying around, but JPL currently has it positioned in a sandy area to specifically monitor how the grains move with its onboard camera. So even though it won't fly, the little helicopter that could will keep doing useful science for us back here on Earth. Once Mars moves past the two degree limit, communications will be reestablished and operations will continue as usual. And now let's take a look at what's coming up next week in spaceflight. 
We've got four missions with Star in their name coming up over the next eight days, three of which are Starlinks. Let's talk about those first. First off, we'll have Starlink Group 628 from Florida currently tracking a four and a half hour launch window that will open on November 18th at four o'clock UTC. Then from Vandenberg, Starlink Group 77 is set to take off within a four hour, 26 minute window that opens on November 18th at 738 UTC. That'll be two back-to-back -back Starlink launches on November 18th. The third Starlink mission next week, Starlink Group 629, is scheduled to launch on November 22nd in the early morning UTC. And there's no prizes for guessing the fourth star mission because as you already know by now, Starship is scheduled for launch tomorrow with a two hour window that opens at 1300 UTC. But of course, we'll be live for many, many hours before then, so you can tune in from approximately six o'clock universal time, that's midnight central time, for our full launch coverage. And of course, Starbase Live is always running 24 hours a day, seven days a week for your viewing pleasure at any time of day. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.